Okay, so uh, we're meeting in a different classroom today, and uh, we, we'll, we'll go through a session for about a, an hour and a half, so a little past seven already. So uh, today's uh, uh, project, if you will, I don't want to just call it a talk, is sort of understanding how you get started with open source. Uh, you guys saw that Revolution OS documentary last week. We've got Ashish here from Open Hatch. Um, that's the Commons Initiative. Uh, he's on the advisory board of the Commons Initiative, uh, commons.swg.edu. Uh, you can go. And uh, it's an open initiative for the whole campus, so you can go there and actually sign up on the mailing list. Anybody who's on campus here can be a part of this. Uh, so when you get a chance, do that. And so she's going to talk a little bit about how he got started with open source, the kinds of things he does, and how you can get started. Uh, we've known him for a while now, uh, through a lot of different projects, uh, all kinds of different things. Some Python stuff, some web stuff, um, disrupting meetings where people are signing keys. That happened a while ago. That's right. <laughs> so all kinds of interesting things. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to Ashish and then uh, take it from there. Great, thanks. Uh, let's my, my notes here. Yeah. Yeah, so thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Can I see some waves? Yeah, it's a bit late in the day. Uh, hopefully, you aren't all completely asleep yet. If you were like me, you'll be, if you were like me in college, you'd be up around like six hours, seven hours from now, so you should be fine. Uh, yeah, thanks to Samir for bringing me here. I think we first met because we were both interested in one laptop per child yep. in 2007 or so. Yep. And if you guys don't know that, it's a product that brings uh, laptops with open source software that are oriented around education to the developing world. And like Samir said, I'm here to talk today about how, to how I became an open source contributor, uh, what that means, give you some stories about how other people I know did that, and through that you'll get a sense of how open source communities communicate about software and about what else they communicate. Uh, we'll also talk at the end about one situation where open source communities attempt to communicate thought they were communicating, but instead left thousands of people vulnerable to eavesdropping by messing up some security. So that should be very interesting, and I think that the background of how it's supposed to work will help you understand how it fits. And at the end, uh, we have a, a little bit of setup online, which I'll give you guys a link to at the end, and that helps you get on IRC, and you can get on IRC and chat with people and also understand, sort of, by trying it yourself, what, uh, how I do a lot of communication, I guess. So, um, I guess a little bit about me. Oh, well, that's what I'm trying to talk about. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the sole employee and the executive director of a nonprofit called Open Hatch, which Samir mentioned briefly. We help people get involved in open source by running in person teaching workshops, mostly at colleges, to help people understand how to get involved in open source and projects they might like to work on. And we also maintain web tools that have some educational tools and some guidance to what projects might be appropriate for people. Uh, in terms of academics, I graduated from Johns Hopkins in 2006 with a cognitive science undergrad degree, minoring in French literature, women and gender studies, and computer science. And then I got a master's in computer science. And professionally since then, I've worked mostly at, at small nonprofits doing mostly Python software development, writing mostly web software, almost all of which has been open source. And uh, generally, I'm really interested in the politics of software. There's so much software that gets developed, but there's so much more that doesn't, and I sort of want to understand what the forces are that drive that, uh, what gets built, who ends up deciding what gets built, and whether or not we have permission to modify and share that. And the other piece of background that I should emphasize is that a lot of my experience in open source comes from work in distribution communities. So, I do work some on projects that users use directly, but I also work largely on projects that take the work of other open source projects, polish it up, and package it, and distribute that. And those are distributions like Debian and Ubuntu. Uh, so that'll sort of color what you'll hear me talk about. Uh, so with that backdrop, let me tell you about how I got involved in open source, and we'll move from there to a couple other people's stories. Before I begin, I want to get a quick show of hands. How many people had heard about open source before they signed up for this class? Presumably everyone could that's how you signed up for it. So can I hear from a few of you about how you heard about it? Yeah. I was just 
just looking into alternatives for like uh, Photoshop, Word, stuff like that. And they're not open really source. Uh, and can I hear another story about it? Yeah. Uh, I would be looking for an application to solve a problem with something small, and 98% of the time I found out that the open source ones work better than the, the ones that didn't, and so I started researching what the heck open source was. Yeah. So uh, that's like how this goes in the 21st century. Uh, in 1999 is when I first heard about something open source, and that was Linux for me. Uh, what happened was I was I was a high schooler at a summer camp where uh, that was held at a university, and a friend of mine and I were both in the library, and he was typing into some kind of console I didn't understand. It looked kind of like this, I guess. And I asked him what it was, and he said, oh, I'm compiling some C++ software on a Linux box. And I knew that C++ was the programming language that like real programmers used. At least that's what I thought 13 years ago. Uh, Linux I hadn't heard of. So I just burned that into my memory, went home, searched for Linux on Hotbot, and found out that it was an open source operating system. Uh, yeah, nowadays it's super easy to find out about open source because there's lots of really popular programs like uh, GIMP is an image editor. Many of you have probably heard of Firefox. Uh, these things are much more popular now. Uh, and I guess the, the key point for me is that the first step in getting involved in open source is actually just discovering that it exists at all. So I guess if you guys watch Revolution OS, you know about Tux, which is the mascot to Linux. Um, Tux's existence was one of the first things I learned about when I read about Linux. I learned that Linux is the kernel of an operating system. It's, uh, it's open source, and I guess since you guys want Revolution OS, you know that means that it gives you permission to use the software for any purpose, permission to understand how the software works, to modify the software, and to share it with people who you might want to give it to. But the thing that was really, there were two other things that really captured my attention on Linux, and why I started installing it on my own computer. And the first sort of boils down to this. How many of you remember? Oh man, I should turn off the lights. Uh, how many of you remember this scene from Jurassic Park? Which one? Yeah, so good. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so in this scene in Jurassic Park, which uh, like a captivated preteen named Ashish watched some time ago, uh, this girl helps save, well, I guess partially save the complex of Jurassic Park. Because when she sees this obscure computer screen, she says, hey, I know this. It's Unix. It'll show me every file. And this is sort of like what Unix was in the 90s, this cool thing that you know, serious people had access to and that I, as a teenager, did not. Uh, and if you missed that, then maybe you, saw, maybe you saw this other movie screenshot from The Matrix 2 where Trinity uses a Linux system to break into some power plant, I guess. Uh, so that's sort of like the backdrop for what I thought Linux was going to be like and why it captivated, captivated me to want to install it. Uh, the other thing was that my, my computer that I happened to be lucky enough to have in my own bedroom as a high schooler was running Windows 98 and that would crash every 20 minutes and I wanted to be online to chat with my friends for more than 20 minutes at a time. So I thought maybe this Linux thing would help me with that. So two things, one it captivated my attention because it's so cool and the other was that it solved a meaningful problem that I had. Uh, the lack of ability to chat with my friends for very long. So I installed it, and it looked kind of like this. Uh, <laughs> this is a screenshot from someone's Hebrew Linux install, but it's about the same as my computer looked. Um, it has all these great programs like uh, Pine for reading email, XMMS, which is just like Winamp, the awesomest. Well, XMMS is totally better than that. Uh, you can see a text editor with the general public license open. This is what my computer looked like anyway. Most importantly, it did actually stay running for longer than 20 minutes at a time, so that was great. And uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, just the fact that uh, the fact that my computer would work better running an operating system, sort of cobbled together by pieces contributed by random people across the globe on the internet, was a pretty remarkable thing for me to figure out. Uh, it really helped me understand that software isn't just something that comes in a box. Uh, where you can't communicate with the vendor. It's just that software is something that's produced by humans. This is what I was slowly learning. Uh, so cool, this software is reliable. But remember, I was captivated. And I heard about these cool Unix things I could do. So I read this web page called Stupid Unix Tricks. And one of them is this. Uh, does anyone here have any idea what this does? So I had no idea what it did. 
um, the web page said if you type this in, uh, well, it turns out it's called a fork bomb, and it takes your computer and immediately fills it with processes that just are executing this. It's something you can type in any command prompt. So if you have a Linux machine or a Mac, you probably don't want to run this right now. Unless you want to do what I did back then, which is have your computer hang, become totally unresponsive, hold the power button down, let it turn off, and power it back on. Uh, so I did all that. I was like, well, that was a stupid Unix trick. That's what it said. Fine. Uh, and then I turned my computer back on, and I discovered that the file system actually wouldn't mount, and I couldn't get access to any of my files. <laughs> so I, luckily, I had a lot of experience breaking computers. Uh, only five or six years before, I had taken my mom's computer, which was the only computer in the house. Uh, and by misunderstanding what the Dell Tech Supports told me to do, I ended up flashing the wrong BIOS onto it, which just long short of it meant that if you press the power button, the computer would do nothing. Luckily, the computer was under warranty, so Dell came by the next day and replaced the entire main board. So that was very convenient. I have a lot of experience fixing broken computers and breaking them myself. Uh, I just have to figure out how to rescue this. And in this case, uh, I knew that there was a tool called File System Check, FSEK, that I could run. So I ran the FSEK, and it ran for a while, uh, but then it crashed. Um, then I ran it again with some extra options, and then it didn't crash, but it uh, finished, but then I still couldn't access my files. And at this point, I need to ask someone for help. So this is where the story transitions from me being a lone user of an open source software project into me arriving at the community. And I found that the documentation for the file system check tool said there's a mailing list for this. Uh, and if you, if, you, if you email the mailing list because you want help with the file system check tool, you should run the following commands to extract the information and upload that to the internet somewhere so that the maintainers of the check tool can reproduce the same problem you have. And so I wrote an email to the mailing list that looks something like this. Uh, it had some extra context. I, I did subscribe to the mailing list, and I absolutely, right, that debug tool that they said to run in order for the maintainers to be able to reproduce the same problem, I ran that because it was supposedly necessary for the maintainers to be able to uh, find my problem. And just to reflect here, it's not, the point of the story is not that if you use open source software, you will misplace all of your files. The point of the sub-story here is that if you use open source software, you should definitely follow the instructions provided by the maintainers if you run into problems, and also that you might find the maintainer. So I sent my note to the, to the mailing list, and I waited for a while, uh, some Thursday afternoon, I don't know what I did without my computer, but I managed to wait. and. Uh, Half an hour later, some other random person on the mailing list replies and says, hey, you might want to run that debug tool extraction again with an even newer version of the software which is available here. Uh, it turned out that the way this file system check tool is developed, they released these pre-release snapshots, uh, which are like not quite good enough to recommend that people use, but they're in development, maybe they're better. Uh, so I tried running that, um, and I realized actually I didn't provide the full error message, so I just wrote a follow-up that said that reminds me, Here's a full error message. Also, I ran the new tool, and here's how it crashed. Uh, actually, let me show you how it crashed. Uh, so far, so good, I guess. And then uh, it looks like this. The thing is, I, don't, I didn't memorize that I got these error messages 11 years ago. Most of these mailing lists are archived on the web. So if you search for, in fact, if you search for Ashish Leroya, please help me recover my data, you'll probably find this discussion I had uh, from back then. And so I just pulled all that into these slides. And I, I provided this new error message to the mailing list with the new pre-release version. And then there was a new email two hours later from someone named Vitaly, whose email address is at namesys.com. And namesys.com was interesting to me, because that was the same place that I read the documentation for how to find the mailing list. I think it was also the server the mailing list was on. So I guess that was someone who was maintaining the file system. And he told me, hey, uh, you, you extracted your debug data wrong, but here's how you do it right. Uh, I'll take a look when you upload the new version. So I did that. Uh, we kept trading emails. And eventually, he gave me a newer version of the software, uh, which, as it happens, pardon me, uh, and as it happens, the newer version did not crash on my data. It actually found all my data. And so I had this. Uh, this revelation at this point that 
unlike the software I used to use, where if it crashes every 20 minutes, there's nothing I can do. In this case, the maintainer of this program is around just to chat by email and will fix problems for me, some random teenager uh, in upstate New York. And this person, I think, is in Russia. Uh, and so at this point, I thought, wow, what an amazing thing. This open source stuff is the coolest thing ever. Uh, and by some, sort of, by some sort of magic, people help me out. Uh, it's worth reflecting now, now that I've had some time to think about this, about the motivations of this guy, Vitaly. Like, why was he on a mailing list for the users of the software? Why was he willing to submit me patches to, that I could test against my file system that would improve my life? Doesn't he have his own things to do? And the answer is that Namesys.com back then was a company that employed him, that sold support services for the same file system I was using. So basically, I was serving as a beta tester for them. I wasn't thinking about it that way. But if I could find a problem before any of their paying customers did, then they could solve it without having a deadline. And then their paying customers would never have to run into it. They'd have lower support costs, they'd have better profits, and I got my file system data back. So the alignment of the incentives actually was there. It wasn't just magic. Uh, it's worth also, though, talking a bit about what worked about my mailing list submission. So first of all, I didn't just submit it to him personally, and that was helpful because uh, someone else, before he replied, uh, someone else said that I should try the pre-release version of the software. Uh, I did read the documentation, so I didn't just show up and say, hey, I can't access my data, what is wrong with you guys, why are you ruining my life? I just, you know, respectfully, not that intensely, asked for help. And I also knew there were some other parts of the system log that I should put into the email, so I did. And I also, you know, I didn't demand an answer. I just said, please help me, I'll do what you say. Uh, I was patient. So, uh, yeah, and if you want to Google for that, um, Ashish Leroya, recover my data is probably good enough. You can probably find it. Uh, but one, uh, one thing that I didn't think about in 2001, after this experience, was the question, was I a contributor to open source by this point? I would say, reflecting now, definitely. What I did back then was I filed a really high quality bug report where I told the maintainers, here is what's wrong with the software. I will help you test a solution for it. And without my, without my email, this software wouldn't have advanced. So in that sense, I certainly did contribute. And so by these metrics, really anything you do as a user of the software that engages the community and helps it achieve its goals. If you're just a programmer, you just remove code, not even adding it. If you're a user and you help submit bug reports, or well, that get solved at least, or you help move bug reports toward being closed, or you have some discussion on the mailing list that helps the developers, I'd say those are all contributions to open source projects. So maybe I can do a quick poll as by these definitions, has anyone here contributed to an open source project? help the project along by submitting a bug or discussing something on the mailing list? Okay, well I would say that those are by far the simplest and when you, have some, when you discover something that's wrong with software you use, you can help yourself and the project by finding out what's going on. So, the other thing that I figured out sort of in hindsight is that most of what I did was I found the right place to show up to. I just uh, put myself on the list, said the wrong thing, did the wrong thing. I uh, set my debug output wrong. I, well, I mostly said the right thing, I guess, because I included all the right, I was respectful. I said it all in a nice way, although I didn't include the right information. Uh, and, you know, from there it all just like progressed without me doing much extra work. Uh, so, if there's one piece of advice that I have, if you want to try to see if there's open source projects that you use that you want to contribute to, the, best, the most important thing to do is just to find that community and show up there. Be that the mailing list, or reading bugs in the bug tracker, or the IRC chat room, which you'll see more about later. So, yeah. Uh, so that's sort of my initial story. Uh, going forward, I want to talk about how I got involved as a more active contributor to the Xbox Linux project. So the Microsoft Xbox One 
was super exciting to Linux enthusiasts in 2002 like myself because this was actually a regular PC in a beautiful black box. Uh, but most importantly, it's discounted. It's cheaper to buy an Xbox in 2002 or 3 than it would be to buy a computer with all the same Intel Pentium 3 and 64 megabytes of RAM and 10 gigabyte hard disk inside. It's discounted because Microsoft expects you to buy games, which they'll make up the difference with. And as just a Linux enthusiast who wanted more people to run Linux and get cheap computers to run Linux on, I thought the Xbox was super cool. So I just showed up, since I knew about showing up, to the Xbox Linux chat room on IRC, which I read about on the xbox-linux.org website. And there I found conversations like this. Uh, hello, hello, hi. Uh, uh, the nickname I use in IRC, which I still do, is Paul Proteus. That's another story. Um, on this chat room, people are just showing up and being friendly. So uh, this uh, IRC channels are also publicly logged, uh, frequently, at least. Um, in this case, Arty, which is short for Artifacts, who is this dude who used to be there all the time, uh, was a regular on the channel. So when he says hi, people will say hi back. Um, but I didn't just show up for the social benefits of saying hi to people I would never meet, I showed up to help people with their questions. So this is actually a recent question 10 years later on the same chat room someone asked. Uh, Tank here, uh, by the way, the Xbox Linux chat room is a lot less active now than it was 10 years ago because the Xbox is less widely used. Uh, but this fellow named Tank shows up and says hello and waits 13, 14, seconds, no one says anything, hey Xbox guys. Uh, if you have a specific question you want to ask on IRC, which is just real-time chat in this old school network system, uh, you're better off just asking your question. Maybe you can say hello in the middle of your question, but you don't need to waste a minute waiting for everyone else to say hi. Uh, this uh, sort of <laughs> explains it. Uh, it's not, I'm not sure it's the right image for this caption, but it does the trick of indicating you need patience when you show up to a chat system. Uh, you don't really know who's chatting on the channel. You don't really know, uh, even if it says there's 50 people that are online, a lot of people just leave their computers connected to IRC and check it every five, 10 minutes. So if you show up and say hello, and then wait for someone to say hello back to answer your question, you sort of probably missed the first batch of ability to get your question answered. But anyway, uh, I found people asking technical questions, and I saw that people were often asking the same technical questions. So eventually, I set up a frequently asked questions page on a wiki that I ran. Uh, Ten years ago, Wikipedia wasn't all that big, and I set up my own separate wiki running my own software on my, well, running software written by the people on my own server uh, that looked kind of like this. This is one of many frequently asked questions pages for open source projects. And so I collected the questions people had and didn't just answer them on the chat room, I also wrote up little articles about those questions. And eventually, uh, so at this point, I really just feel like a fan who happens to be in the right place, who wants to be helpful. I didn't feel like I was a part of the Xbox Linux community, but uh, eventually the, oh yeah. Um, you can see, by the way, that other, this is an example of IRC etiquette on other chat rooms. This is how people ask questions on the <laughs> Python programming languages twisted frameworks chat room. And um, you know, in general, there's this evolution of questions that get merged into web pages that answer the questions. Um, and so uh, if you use IRC a lot, you'll also know that if you have a lot you want to say, like this long error message that you want to put into the channel, you're supposed to use what's called a paste bin, where you take this giant ball of text you have, you paste it into this website, it gives you a short URL like that, and that's how you share it. So, hooray, in this little snippet after that conversation, everyone's happy, you should always thank people when they help you on IRC. And so I was receiving a lot of thanks, it was very nice, and eventually the product maintainer, whose name is Michael Style, showed up to the channel and said, hey, your wiki is great, we should link to it from the main website. All this time I'd actually just been posting the wiki on my own personal site. Uh, you don't need any kind of formal inclusion in a project a lot of the times to contribute. If what you're doing doesn't require permission, you can just do it. So that was pretty exciting for me. Um, 
I felt like finally I was part of that community. One other thing you should know about IRC is that bots are often around. Bots are what they sound like, automated agents that respond to queries. This person was having a problem in 2002 or 3 with a webcam, so he was looking for web pages that might help him, and by doing that in public on the channel, he was hoping that we would provide feedback on those web pages he was finding. Uh, but Catfish had this other, oh yeah, uh, recently on the Xbox Linux chat room, someone signed on and said, hey, you should all join this Christian chat channel. And then this person left. So this is bad netiquette. Don't just show up to random chat rooms, advertise your thing, and leave. Hopefully that's pretty simple. Um, but in terms of bots, uh, in IRC, if you type slash quit, it makes you leave all the channels. Catfish thought, hey, what if we get the bot to type slash quit? Would it leave the channel? And so uh, I was like, what a great question. Hmm, can I get it to spell things? And I finally did get it to spell things with a slash in front of them, and finally got it to spell slash quit, and then it didn't leave. And this is really bad netiquette. I'm like chatting with this bot, trying to trick it into leaving the channel, while lots of other people are just around to answer questions. Uh, if you Google, if you Google Paul Proteus spell quit with two T's, you'll probably find this conversation, and it goes on for like 15 minutes. It's terrible. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> think about the other people in the chat room before wasting all of their space. Uh, yeah, so, so that's uh, a brief story about IRC. I want to switch gears a bit and talk about other kinds of contributions to open source. My started with my friend Greg Grossmeyer. So, Greg Grossmeyer, uh, he wanted to start an Ubuntu user community in Eastern Michigan. Uh, Eastern, I think? Yeah. Um, he was a big fan of Ubuntu, this was back around 2007, and uh, really wanted other people to hang out with and talk about Ubuntu and work through problems with it together. So the first thing he did was create an email list, similar to the RiseRFS email list that we saw before, um, this time oriented just at Ubuntu users in the United States in Michigan. And he sent an email to that mailing list saying that we should have a user group, here's where we should meet up, sorry, a western suburb of Detroit. And he also, in that email saying what he wanted the user group to look like, uh, he wanted to sort of set the tone for what meetings would feel like. And uh, in general, it's really good if you have an idea for an open source project to be concrete about what you envision success being. So uh, he did that, and eventually he got his user group together. Uh, within only a few months, it was actually the most active Ubuntu user group in the country, maybe the world. And uh, one thing they knew, like many people who use software know, is that software is buggy. So one of the things the user group, user group did together is they would go through the Ubuntu bug tracker and find bugs that people had filed that needed some help. So this is a community of people who I think, could, I think none of them knew how to write any software. Like me on the Xbox Linux channel, they didn't just want to contribute by writing more code, they wanted to do something else to move the project forward. So, in their case, they did, Greg did a few things. Uh, one thing he did, like it says, is to enhance a bug report. So in general, in open source, like we all know the software has bugs, but there's public bug trackers. I don't know, do they cover that in Revolution OS at all? Anyway, there's web pages that people enter bug reports into uh, and that are publicly archived again. One of, the, one of the really, I think, great things about open source projects is that they're almost entirely done in public. So, it's really easy to find out what the current state of the product is and jump in. And if you have a problem, then uh, the project won't hide that, and you can find the discussion where people are trying to solve that problem. So Greg found this issue in Ubuntu just on the bug tracker, and it has this complex title, but what it can be summarized as is this program, when you run it, fails immediately. Uh, Greg wasn't sure if maybe this particular bug was because the person's computer was failing, or if in fact the software, as distributed by Ubuntu, was totally broken. So he checked, and lo and behold, the software was in fact totally broken. Uh, easy to reproduce, you just install the program, you try to run it, and it won't run. But that's useful information, because now the developers for this package know that it's not just the one person who filed the report that has the problem. Another thing he did was to, ah uh, yes, uh, there's, I wanna pause and say that there's this website with, with great information on how to file a really good bug report. This 
slide is most interesting, probably if you look at it afterwards, for this URL. Um, I think this describes how to make a simple self a simple self-contained correct example when you're describing a problem and you want to really help the developers fix it. Um, but Ubuntu, I think they get about it, it was 200 new bugs filed per week um, at, at a recent count. So they have a lot of bugs open in the bug tracker. And a lot of those bugs are just no longer relevant. Like there are four software that has since been fixed. Oh. This bug is none of those bugs. This is just a really bad bug. Someone filed a bug whose title is link not working. And in the description, they say, in order to reproduce it, KGU. The actual results. This is all like nonsense. I hope in the back you can read it. But uh, one of the maintainers of this program just says, don't spam Bugzilla, please. This is not the way to file a good bug report. Uh, Greg, anyway, knew that there's lots of bug reports in Ubuntu that are open that don't need to still be open. So he found this one, which, by the way, have any of you used Usenet? Yeah, OK. Uh, so Usenet is this historic uh, email list-like service that was really popular in the 1980s when internet connections were mostly over dial phones and you would send out all your, email, your emails once a day because that was how often your computer would connect to the other computer. Usenet was a way to synchronize all those group messages around. And there's a program called PAN that lets you read those Usenet messages. Anyway, so in that context, PAN had a problem where some lines would wrap it properly. Uh, Greg noticed that this, this bug was open but it seemed like the program was actually fixed. So he just left a message on the, on the bug saying, hey, this issue should be fixed. Uh, is it really fixed? And that just sends a message to all the people who are involved in that bug report, and it sends that to them. Finally, the person who filed the report uh, replies saying, yep, yeah, it's been a long time since the original report. It's totally fixed. I just tried it again. You can close this bug. So. Greg right here is, is fighting the tide. Uh, there's two, like 200 new bug reports per week as of a really old count. I don't even know what those numbers are nowadays. Uh, so these are some really powerful ways to contribute to open source projects without touching any source code, just contributing to the community. But I will tell you how I first made my code, the first code contribution I made to an open source project. So I'd been excited about Linux 99. I filed that terrified mailing list post in 2001 and was advocating open source for five years. Uh, finally, 2006, when I was at my first real software engineering internship, I ran into a problem with pie charts. So I was using this software package to generate pie charts like this one, I mean this exact pie chart. And these labels here were too far into the middle of the pie. So then for the really narrow slices, uh, these the bits of text would be on top of each other. So uh, it turned out that in the pie chart generation tool I was using, you couldn't choose how far out from the center the text was. So I found the source to the pie chart generation. I changed it so you could customize that. Uh, and then eventually I decided I would share that with the, with the world. Uh, so I, sent, I joined this mailing list again. Matplotlib is the name of the package I was using. I said, hey, uh, here is here is what's wrong with the software. Here's why I made the change I made. Here's how I tested it. And uh, I want you all to accept it. Please let me know if you have any feedback. And then I waited for about a month, and there was no reply. So I actually sent the email again saying, hey, I sent this a month ago. And the maintainer, John D. Hunter, replies, hey, Ashish, sorry we missed it. Uh, turns out he had some technical problems actually merging the patch into the project, so I resent it with a different set of formatting, and then he says, thanks, it's in. So now, anyone who uses, who, anyone who wants to customize how close to the center of a pie chart text appears in this particular pie charting program used by Python programmers, many of them are scientists, so maybe it gets used, uh, that little bit is my contribution. <laughs> Which is somewhat narrow, but uh, that's all I needed to make the software be what I needed to get my job done. And literally, I would have had to switch to a different pie charting program if it weren't for the ability to customize that. So uh, I'm glad I could do that. And I did all that at work. So that's how it's supposed to go. Uh, 
let me talk to you about another example of all this communication. So, um, for background, there's a project called OpenSSL, and it's a security package. One of the things it's supposed to help you do is generate random numbers. Random numbers are extremely important in computing. Uh, they are, if, if people on the internet can guess the random numbers you use that are involved in securing communications between you and your bank's website, for example, then they can decrypt the entire conversation between you and them. So it's really important on your computer to generate really random, random numbers. Luckily, there's software out there for this that's open source that people widely use. So uh, that's thing number one to know. Thing number two is that there's a package called Valgrind, and when it, it its purpose in life is to test software to find certain categories of bugs. And when it finds certain categories of bugs, it gives you a message like this. Uh, the contents of this message aren't that important. The point is that this automatic check tool will check your software if you let it. So, uh, act one is scene one. Somebody submits a bug against Debian, this uh, distribution di distributor of open source software that takes all these other packages, bundles them up, and makes them easy to install. And the bug says, hey, uh, right now, if you use OpenSSL as it comes in Debian, and you write new software that uses OpenSSL, then it's some of the SSL library somehow makes it hard to detect memory error bugs in your program because of the memory error bugs that exist in OpenSSL itself. So it just like prints lots of warnings and you can't find the ones that are related to your code. It would be better if we cleaned up OpenSSL so that it would clean, so the only automa automatically found issues were in the actual program I wrote. Uh, so the maintainer of OpenSSL says, actually this submission, the the change that you're submitting, along with this change request, is not the right way to do it. Uh, this guy named Kurt Rotz, R-O-E-C-K-X. Uh, <clears throat> and so he says, what your fix is, is not quite right. But he knows that he doesn't know everything about generating random numbers securely. So he goes off and asks the OpenSSL dev mailing list. He goes to the project's website, finds the only technical mailing list he can find, information about, and says, hey, uh, I want to make sure that this fix that I'm going to apply, that will apply for all Debian users, is a correct fix. So, good, he asked the right question. Uh, and he gets back an answer that says, absolutely, if it makes life easier to for debugging, totally apply the fix that you think is right and remove that bit of code that seems to just be adding errors to the automatic checking. So he does that. Uh, he does it pretty quickly, and then this software is released as part of Debian. It goes into lots of Ubuntu systems, lots of deployed, installed systems, web servers, laptops, all over the world. And then a couple years later, some other Debian developer is trying to generate random numbers on his computer. And you can see in this IRC exchange that, uh, you can see in this IRC exchange that Luciano is getting less randomness than he thought. Uh, he's finding, he's trying to generate a couple of thousand of these every, just over the course of the day. And when he does that, he finds that about five of them are the same. And if you have five repetitions in a random number generation sequence where you only do a thousand uh, searches, or a thousand generations of random numbers, something is probably wrong. So he investigates. Um, it turns out that this investigation results in a Debian security advisory because there are only about 32,000, exactly 32,767, possible random numbers that were generated by this library because of the change that was made. Uh, so I guess I'll borrow the whiteboard for a sec. If I know where the pen is. Oh, do you have one there? Uh, there's one on this side of the whiteboard, on the projector. OK. So, um, so in, this, in this random number generation file, there's two calls that look like this in different parts of the file. They look just the same. Um, and Kurt emailed saying, hey, this line number of this one, line number of this one. OK, if I delete them, and you LB or whatever at OpenSSL.org said, yeah, if it helps the debugging, it's fine to delete them. And he deletes them. It, this one uh, is not actually needed. This one is, in fact, needed. 
Uh, that's where the randomness comes from. But because the OpenSSL code is such a mess, uh, he accidentally he accidentally makes it so that there are only the 32,767 possible random numbers that can be generated by this library. And what this means in practice is that because of this communication failure, uh, there's um, there's keys for a system called SSH that you use to authenticate yourself to a, to a faraway computer. Um, it means it was extremely easy for the duration of these two years for anyone anyone to be impersonated if they generated their numeric identifier in that period. Um, it was really, really bad having like lived through that, I guess. Um, and so I want to just do a quick review of what went wrong for Kurt in this case. Uh, so the first thing was that the OpenSSL code was too complex and clever. Um, this, it was too, it was kind of repetitious and a mess. Uh, the other thing was that apparently, so when, when Damien issued that security advisory, um, the OpenSSL maintainers of the main OpenSSL project, the first thing they did was write this long, scathing, well, it's being recorded. Uh, uh, one thing that one of them did was to write a long, I would still say scathing blog post about how terrible it is that Debbie would modify software that we wrote and we know how this is supposed to work. And uh, why would they, when they ask this question, ask an OpenSSL dev, the correct mailing list of the OpenSSL team? Well, OpenSSL, the difference apparently is that OpenSSL dev is where you go if you want to build on top of this software. And OpenSSL team is where the people who are mo not modifying this software itself discuss this project. But this mailing list is mentioned exactly zero times on the OpenSSL website. So there was no way for this Debian developer to know they should talk to the secret mailing list uh, of the people who really know what's going on. And also, Kurt got an answer from someone at OpenSSL.org, so probably was a trustworthy person who just didn't do their homework. Now, uh, on the other hand, Kurt, all he did was send a line number. Uh, what he could have done is send what's called a patch file, which contains a very clear listing of what gets removed and what gets added. And that would have improved the ability of people to understand what he was talking about. Maybe then they would have said, don't do that. Uh, but the other problem is that this person who said, yeah, sure, that's fine, was just being careless. Uh, it turns out with some pretty big consequences. So I don't know what the fix is to that. Uh, and yeah, the other the other thing is that Kurt, uh, when he made this change in the official Debian in the Debian branch of OpenSSL, he removed both of these calls, and he noticed that the problem he was trying to solve went away, which is that it no longer gave you this warning. Uh, if he had tried just removing the bottom one, though, the problem would have also gone away, and it would have also gotten rid of the warning. So Kurt, maybe he should have tried removing only one first and seeing if the problem actually went away. Uh, still, like, removing two lines versus removing one line, they look pretty small. So if you want to read more about this, uh, you can go here. The slides will be online. I can put a link to this in the, the closing info page. And that's sort of uh, what I have for you. So I'm happy to answer some questions if you guys have them. And also, uh, when we're happy Q&A-wise, you can go to this URL, install an IRC client, and chat with people using that. So thanks for bringing me, and do you guys have any questions? <laughs>